Uh, well, uh, the the, uh, the uh, foundation has been laid for uh, a session on water. We've heard uh, this morning a number of times that water is a potentially limiting resource and one that we're drawing down at a great rate. So let's spend the next hour and a half or so uh, thinking about water as a, a key component of this, this uh, nexus between climate and agriculture. Our first speaker this morning is Upmanu Lal, who is a distinguished professor of engineering at Columbia University and director of the Water Center at Columbia University. And without further ado, Upmanu, uh, the stage is yours. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to come and talk. Uh, it's sort of embarrassing because there are so many people that you are who are doing much more interesting work than I am on this topic. So I don't know why they had me come over. Um, anyway, I threw this question together, and uh, my plan was: you see the question, and I'll say yes, and go sit down, and we'll be done. Uh, I guess you aren't going to go for that, right? Okay. So the this peak business, peak oil, peak food, peak water keeps coming up. And the person who's been preaching peak water is Peter Glick uh, out of California. And I wanted to throw that up as the starting question because that sort of is, you know, it's almost what you ask once you throw this question up to begin with. And if you parse that question, obviously you look at what's, go what's going to be the supply in the future for water. The climate change question typically comes up. And what's going to be the demand for water in the future? I'm going to try to weave the two things together. Um, and I'm going to advertise the way I think about this issue, which is perhaps a bit different from the way many people seem to talk about, particularly in the climate change context. And that is, uh, many people think of every input as what is available. That is on average. And I think with water, that's the wrong way to think about the problem. It's the variability, the availability of water in space and time, uh, essentially the volatility aspect. That's more interesting from an agriculture point of view and a sustainability point of view and provides the link with climate. So I'll try to build that, but I'm going to reverse the order in which I do this, and I'll talk about that right at the end. Um, in terms of how we address uh, the availability of water and the variability, the obvious hint is to climate and variability, but you know, we've tried to solve that in many ways through technology. So the quick hint there here is that we could look at technologies not for agriculture necessarily, but definitely overall in terms of water reuse and purification. There are people who now want to talk about reverse osmosis and using that for agriculture, and we can think about that. I don't think that's the direction to go necessarily. Um, Greenhouses, some people are doing interesting things with condensation of okay, evaporate and using that. There is the so called Sahara project from the Germans, which is also way out there and interesting. Uh, I'll talk towards the end a little bit about geoengineering and uh, weather climate, and you'll see where I take that. There's the ocean cultivation story. This is tied to the GMO story to a certain extent. There are people who are looking at ocean margins uh, and genetically engineering crops, particularly rice that can grow in ocean margins, so that's another source that we could look at. Uh, and if you view agriculture broadly, there's agriculture, so that's a totally new game there. Uh, there's possible innovation in storage and distribution, so we could discuss that. Finally, on the demand side, since we are focusing on food, we <coughs> deal with that. And the big story here that I think we need to focus on is what are the opportunities for conservation or shifting use, and that try to develop that story, and there's the diet, they're training, the water use efficiency storage stories there. But more importantly, what we don't talk about is the integration of economics and food and water storage. So the economics here is not just the cost of cultivation and what you do with it, but also the financial securitization of this enterprise, because that can issue interesting signals in addition to the price signals as to the kind of things you do. So that's overall what I'm trying to do, and the way our content structure is uh, perhaps obligatory, because there's so many people who have now built a cottage industry of doing these integrated model analyses and scenarios. So I'll talk a little bit about what these people are doing and whether or not it actually is useful. Uh, and whether or not it's qualified by looking at what we use trends, and the question I ask is, are these scenario builders capable of explaining what we have seen in the past? If they are, good. Um, maybe they're not. 
So you see what the utility is. And then finally, I talked a little bit about some work we have done in India uh, as to improving the water situation in the context of agriculture as a way of thinking about what it would do in the larger context and finding out climate variability. So starting with uh, some way of that water people typically talk about this stuff. So the top left picture is a picture from the World Water Assessment Program from your 2012 report. And what they are doing is they are putting these beautiful pictures up of where in the world there is no water scarcity green, where there's physical water scarcity, where light blue is where they are approaching water scarcity there, you know, and definitions. And lastly, the darker blue is the economic water scarcity, where there is water, but the, the, the economics doesn't allow you to actually develop access, storage, and distribution effectively. So there's various ways these people do that, but the reason I have this picture here is not to talk about their metrics of water scarcity, but to simultaneously show you the population projections and where people think the populations of the world will grow by 2050, the 9 billion question in a way, 30% increase on doing not today. And what's surprising here is that essentially they're putting most of this population growth in areas which are significantly water scarce. Okay. And I wonder, just at the zero level, say, okay, is that really going to happen? You know, because for that to happen, if it's food, if it's water limited and food limited, and it could be water limited because of economic scarcity or physical scarcity, it still is limited, and that economy is not going anywhere unless there's outside help. Are we going to be shipping food to these people and creating a dependence? Are we shipping other things to these people to create that dependence? Or if this projection is true, are we creating a situation where there's a strong economic diffusion argument that people will move out of those places? So the equilibrium sort of projections people make on individual elements don't sort of ring true to me when at the outset looking at something like this. Uh, so the next sort of thing to put up, I think the top set of graphs was put up by uh, Max earlier. Uh, but the, the, there are three sets of graphs here, and the collective statement that I want to make from them is that yes, we've had dramatic increases in agricultural productivity in terms of yields per unit land area, but in many of the places they're starting to plateau out, and that's what concerns people. And where these plateauing things are happening, the argument is that we have reached technological barrier, and maybe part of the technological barrier is related to the picture on the bottom left, which is that we have had a dramatic increase in irrigated agriculture, and in some of these places we have sort of reached the limit of what is going on. And that's the limiting factor. And the interesting thing about what this group talks about in terms this is a PMS article, you know, this study will be a real review, I guess. So the interesting thing about this is that it really hits the variability point home. So what you're looking at on the bottom right is grain yields on the x-axis. And um, the variability, coefficient of variation of grain yields on the y axis, and the yellow dots are all rain fed agriculture, and the blue dots are all irrigated agriculture. So the message you're getting is not only is the irrigated yield on the mean much higher than the rain <coughs> fed yield, but it doesn't really vary that much. Okay, so that gives you the stability that you probably need in terms of meeting food security. So that's the message we get out of this slide is that. Maybe we should be worried really because our opportunity for doing this game is starting to be exhibited. So another way of looking at this is this through this graphic from uh, David Bolton, uh, in a FAO report. And what he does is he plots all the different grains together. And uh, on the x-axis again is the yield per unit area. And on the y-axis is the water productivity. So this is yield per unit water. Okay, so that sort of speaks to the opportunity that you have. And he kind of draws a curve through this all the way through, and he says where the yields are currently lowest per unit area is the highest opportunity for improving water productivity because the technology level is the lowest. Now, the interesting thing is that those areas actually cover the largest pieces of land on Earth. So, in a way, that speaks to the fact that maybe we Water is not a limiting factor from that point of view because we have a lot of upstream. Uh, but we have no investment there. So, so it's not a surprise that the Chinese, being really smart people, are trying to take over lands which correspond to this particular situation. 
Uh, now, moving very quickly into these future projections that people do. So this is from uh, IFPRI. So Shimin Kai, who's at University of Illinois, has been involved in this. So they, they have this projection where they do a ratio of areas where the water withdrawals divided by the average water available. So it's average divided by average volatility is not accounted for, is greater than 0.4. Uh, or some number. So the color scheme indicates the percentage that is greater than that. So you see the Western United States, uh, Sub Saharan Africa, uh, parts of Asia are red. So this is reflecting now the, the balance or imbalance between supply and demand in a certain sense projected out to 2050 if you don't increase water productivity. And in their analysis, if you do some modest improvements in water productivity, you can see there is some improvement, but it is not terribly drastic. So their story is that if you just do modest improvements in water productivity, you're not really changing the game substantially. Uh, so that's interesting uh, because what you will find is that a lot of these people who are doing these scenario analyses into the future, they will do one-off analyses. I change one factor, does it really matter or not? Then somebody else will change another factor and see what happens. So this is another paper now from 2013, and it's got a similar picture on the left. And what the way these people deal with it is they say, okay, uh, you can play this game of like how much of an impact you will have or not, but maybe you should really look at economically what does that mean. So economically what they're doing is they're doing a least cost uh, optimization for producing a certain amount of food. And then given the water constraint in every place in the world, they are looking at the shadow price, which is what would you be willing to pay to have more water in each of those places. And what jumps out at you is not a surprise that the places which were close to using up most of their water end up in a very high shadow price. If you look at South Asia, that jumps out. If you look at parts of China, that jumps out. Then when they project this out to 2045, those things get much worse, suggesting that those are the places where the water constraint becomes a big issue. Again, the analyses these people do are at monthly or seasonal sort of time scales in terms of how they do it. They have a variety of integrated models that they go through, and, it, and they try to do uncertainty analyses off of them also. So the way these people did their games is they say, well, suppose we allow trading of free trade, which suggests now that spatial equalization is available to you, but they don't do this in time. The trading is a, the same snapshot on average. Or we say that, okay, people are saying that diet is changing so that people are using more, eating more meat, but we are going to restrict them so that everybody equitably gets 20% meat and that's it. So that's their livestock story. And then their bottom one is if you allow trade and you allow livestock, so the main thing that jumps out at you from this is that uh, Indians don't need meat. So if you actually allow them to have 20% of meat, that sounds like that's going to aggravate things because meat uses a lot more water. But even so, if you do allow trade and you do it livestock, what you find is that the shadow price change is about 0.5, whereas the highest shadow price they got to in the business as usual scenario was 0.8. So that suggests that those two measures by themselves could essentially by 2045 offset climate change and all sorts of other things that are going on. Which is kind of interesting, but uh, so summarizing, what do we learn from these scenario games? I didn't expose all these points, but I'll summarize them anyway. First, if you look at climate models, as Max alluded uh, to earlier, precipitation is not really well resolved by these models. There's high uncertainty. More importantly, if you look at the statistics of precipitation retrospectively in climate models, there are significant biases. So extrapolating things which have strong biases to me is problematic. Forget uncertainty in that case. So not quite sure what to do about that. Uh, the main message you get out of all scenarios is that you get increasing water stress in many places in the world unless you impose a variety of demand management scenarios. And this stress is dominated by population and consumption more than it is dominated by the precipitation scenario. So that's important to keep in mind because what that says is that if you only look at the precipitation variability or water supply variability, you really need to focus much more on the demand side than on the supply side in a sense. Again, keep in mind that these people don't look at the volatility aspect as they should. Uh, finally, uh, you get from these scenarios very modest gains from water productivity. And my editorial comment on that is that 
when the irrigation community first started putting out their efficiency estimates for irrigated agriculture, the numbers were showing up for flooding uh, irrigation particularly at only 10 to 15 percent efficiency. Over time, these people have revised those numbers to be 45 or so because they want to do basin averages. I really question whether that's the best way to look at it because in terms of withdrawal and application, you're still putting a lot of water out there. And that matters in terms of the constraint you have in terms of what you're withdrawing against. The implication here is that if you claim you have 45% accurate efficiency, to go from 45 to 55 is a modest increase, which is what these people are reflecting. But if you're at 10 and you can go to 20, now that's a substantial increase over what you currently have. And that's the, where, where this thing becomes different. None of these integrated scenarios consider significant water infrastructure improvements, jointly with conservation scenarios, and jointly with looking at economic analysis. So we actually do not have a clean story to tell, is the point. Okay, so how good are these things? So let's look at the United States and see what has happened. So on the top left, I have groundwater use as a fraction of total water use, and you can see the areas where we have higher water stress as per the maps that we were looking at before we have higher groundwater use. It makes sense, because the renewable supply is limited to have to draw on something else. But look at the top right graph, and the blue curve shows you, blue dots show you what our total aggregate agricultural water use has done. The green curve shows you what has been the cost associated with that. So our costs have been going up, and our water use has been coming down. Right? So that's kind of interesting because actually our agricultural product has been consistently going up and has not gone down in the process. Why this has happened is that we have had a transition to different crops over this time period. We have had a modest transition to different means of doing irrigation technologies. The challenge that I would like to put before the integrated modeling community is, can you please reproduce this graphic for me using your models as to what, you know, what has actually happened here? And it's not clear that that works out. Uh, similarly, on the urban side, it's interesting, the blue curve, which is bringing up and down, uh, is the New York City water use. Uh, the green curve is New York City population. The light blue curves are predictions made for future water demand of New York City at different times. And you can see the most recent projections keep going up and the most recent use keeps going down. This is not true just for New York City. Take a variety of cities in the United States and you'll see the same thing. So my point is that we are very far away from being able to say something about water consumption. Unfortunately, and he, we can't hide behind huge uncertainties in climate models here. We simply do not have the wherewithal to do it, and this is something we have to address. Another graphic of the same sort, this is groundwater use globally, and you can see India really jumps up there and takes off, and within India, uh, there's a lower graphic, you see that the groundwater use takes off, and the surface water use actually tapers off despite significant investments in surface water infrastructure. And you wonder what is going on with all this. In the Indian case, I can explain to you very easily that it's the government policies of making electricity free for agriculture. So, you know, it's a free for all, you jump up. So there, if you could predict that that's going to happen, you would have a good story in your integrated scenario model. If you can't predict that, you have actually no story at all. So let me talk a little bit about India, because we've done some work there. And the framing here is that, OK, can we supply water for 9 billion people for food production? If I go back to when I was a kid, you could make the same question and say you have 400 million people. We are predicting you'll have 1.2 billion people. We were not. But let's say we were. Would you supply the, the food for these people, given that we were not making it in terms of supplying food for the 400 million people? Okay, so that's sort of the framing with respect to water. And the, the, the graphic here shows that essentially this is driven by economics. So if you look at the bottom right picture, it shows you average income levels versus percentage of irrigation in a district in India, and it's basically a straight line. So that motivates behavior, and what you see on the top graphic is India has one of the highest densities of irrigation of all kinds that shows up, at least in certain parts of India. So, we got into this game, uh, and I've been away from India for 40 years, roughly. So, I, you know, going there as a foreigner, the interest was looking at groundwater depletion in selected areas and trying to understand what goes on. So, one of the things that we did here was we were able to get county level data on a uh, very high level of detail of economics, water, water, and other things. 
So the interesting thing was that the diagnosis we had of the Indian situation was the cause of the desire for food security. The government of India had put in a food procurement system where there is a bunch of crops that they procure at guaranteed prices from specific locations, even though the price is advertised everywhere, they only procure from certain locations. So in those places, effectively what happened is that instead of having a diverse crop ecosystem, you ended up with monoculture. And crops that are not exactly suitable for the application from a biological or water availability perspective. So the question I asked was, okay, suppose you maximize net farm revenue, because we have all the data to do that particular computation, where would you put these crops? And who would make a difference? And so we ran this game as rate fed and irrigated. And I'm only showing you the rate fed results here because they were a shock to me. On average, it turns out that you could actually meet the needs of India's food procurement system with purely rate fed agriculture. You don't even have to do irrigation. So then you look at the huge groundwater depletion and you say, what are these people doing? So this is purely tricky crops using current crop productivity at the district level and using a crop model which essentially says that if I have a certain crop water deficit, I'm going to knock percentage wise that productivity down. And it works. And you can see how you know where the crops go and so forth. And the interesting thing here is that if you look at the left picture, that's the amount of storage you would need uh, to meet the crop water requirements each place. And you can see in the northwest of India, that's severe. Okay, this is a ratio to average annual rainfall, and that ratio is like five years or something of rainfall, so it goes off. But simply by moving the crops, you basically have balance across the whole country. What does this do in terms of income? The farm income almost everywhere in the country increases, except where you move rice and meat out of. But remember here that the, the prices are guaranteed by the government, and they could easily offset it uh, by looking at the whole picture. So this was interesting. We presented this to the government of India, the previous government. Uh, their response was to go to the World Bank and ask them to repeat our work. Uh, the second thing we've been doing in India is to actually look from the bottom up. So this was a top-down approach. So from the bottom up, we were interested in seeing what could you actually do to stimulate adoption of different technologies that are currently available. Uh, so that form what we use was reduced, and we worked with Punjab Agricultural University to do this. To date, since 2009, we have worked with this is 8,000 farmers. We are at about 10,000 farmers now. So each of these farmers has done a paired experiment where they take an acre out of their land and they do something we tell them to do, and then they do whatever they are normally doing in the rest of their land. Then they compare yields and they compare water outcomes and so forth. So the summary statement from this is that what we found was rather surprising. We thought that any irrigation technologies, various kinds of things, would be the most effective because that's what I've been told. What we actually found was that simply taking soil moisture sensors uh, was the most cost-effective way and the highest rate of adoption in the farmers we were working with, particularly when combined with things like laser level, which they were in three or four years. So the degree of savings on rice, where people are applying 2.2 meters of water in a place where the average annual rainfall is 70 centimeters, was we were down to 1.2 meters for the best case and 1.5 meters for the worst case for farmers who are following what we're doing, which is remarkable just from that one intervention. So what this tells me is that actually the slack that we have, and remember this is withdrawals and application, and you could argue that some of this comes back, the, the slack we have in the agricultural systems to pick up something like this is there, and one could actually do something in the irrigated agricultural world. What we have started moving towards, working with the Department of Science and Technology in India, those two fine gentlemen up above, is we are now, we are now starting to manufacture many of these sensors uh, at much lower cost in India. So the sensor that you see here, there's a chlorophyll sensor, there's a soil moisture sensor, which is a electrical conductivity, plus an oscillator capacitor, plus a thermal infrared. You take all that together, and in the US setting, this is around $2,000 per feet. We are at $55 to do this. And uh, there are variants of this that we are doing which have wireless networking capability and can control pumps and get you to $100. And what I started thinking was, originally we were doing this for farmers in India. But what I started realizing is that large farms in the United States need many of these, and that's what we need to bring back here. So you know, from a technical point of view, there's really a lot of scope here. But Subsequently, we also decided that, okay, this is still dangerous. You have to convince a lot of people. So 
So what we are now working with is with private sector people to try to come up with a business model where you fly drones and interestingly, these folks came to the US, asked me how do you get digital elevation measurements and put them in touch with people who do drones. They were excited, they were told the US will not allow you to export this technology, so they have built the drones themselves, including the cameras and the autopilot systems. So that drone that you see there is a four foot wingspan, it's $1,500 total, including the camera. So that's a picture from this, you can get 20 centimeter resolution. You fly this drone at 120 kilometers per hour, it lasts for about one and a half hours. And the idea for the business model is that farmers would pay two to three dollars a month per farmer. The business aggregator will provide market information, prices, will provide weather forecast information, guidance on how to use that, and guidance on nitrogen and water application, simply uh, aggregating this information across there. So that's the kind of thing we're moving to because you can get scale from this much more easily and you need private sector engagement and you can get private sector engagement. I'm not disparaging the public sector, but we feel this is the way to go. So that's the story there, and I'm quickly going to jump to the climate part of the story. So the thing I want to point out here for variability here at a global scale is the following. This is a paper by Dye and Fredbert where they looked at on current effects in terms of drought and flood. So that's the purple and the blues there, opposite signs, uh, during different El Nino phases. So the El Nino comes off and on. And essentially what you're seeing here is that there's significant spatial correlation across the globe, positive and negative. So when you think about price shocks and managing a global food system, one needs to think about something like this. One quick thing that I put up, this was just in yesterday's paper, is in Colombia this year, there was a forecast that this, could, this is going to be a fairly dry year. So the scientists advised these farmers to plant early. The farmers association told them not to plant. Okay. And the people who did not plant did substantially better than the people who did plant because they got screwed with the outcome. So the interesting thing here is that sometimes not planting and preserving capital is perhaps an adaptation strategy. Moving to this, uh, the work we have done in terms of our models works with daily weather data. And so there was a point that was made by of going to seasonal from seasonal to monthly. The interesting thing is that uh, what, what I'm thinking about now is actually geoengineering weather. Uh, here's an example of an uh, atmospheric river, moisture being spewed off from the tropics and landfall in California. This kind of phenomena happens routinely everywhere. This is another example of it that I quickly throw out. We were looking at floods in Assam, India, and uh, this is a moisture track that starts off in the tropics and goes wherever. And what we found was that in all these huge flood events in Assam, that track was actually heading for Korea and Japan. It's, it's, it's incidental that this dump happened there. But the point is that I think we can engineer where and when we, these tracks form and where they go. And that's another way to look at how we can actually adapt at a very large scale. So I'll skip this and I'll jump to my summary because I was warned that I'm using up all the time possible. So the current global water scarcity crisis it basically is marked by two factors. One is poor water usage strategies that come from unregulated and poorly priced use and uh, people trying to adapt to climate variability and overdoing it to some extent. Second, the projections of the future really do not address these issues effectively. So we have to get into that as a research issue. Third, the better water use strategies in agriculture can buy us almost as much water as what we are projecting we need more food into the future. So if you, can, if you can manage the variability in the process, I don't really see a problem with getting us to that particular level. Um, the water stress issue is a problem because in a way, it limits agricultural productivity, which limits income, which limits investment in improving water use efficiency. So that's the conundrum that one has to really solve in terms of aid and developing some things there. And technologically, there's a lot of options for innovation here. I'm just going to leave this up here because this was a fun story and so on. We have a few minutes for questions. And a reminder, there are microphones here, so all of you hear the questions. Uh, There's a switch on the top. Um, oh. uh, I'll, I'll 
talk wildly. So in the energy uh, regime, the story about increased efficiency solve that energy problems. However, the increased efficiency requires uh, affecting decisions of billions of individuals, hundreds of thousands of corporations. You're saying water efficiency will solve the problem, but you have to affect the decisions of and how will you do that? Yeah, uh, Sadhguru, my friends, the economists for this, because they are the experts at GD human behavior by pricing. So, uh, but realistically, what we are seeing is that I think where there is increasing scarcity, you have a natural driver. I used to have a perception that farmers are responsive to risk. What we have sort of learned through field interactions, and this is anecdotal, is that their first priority is increased yield. Their second concern is risk. Risk is gone. Okay, but uh, if you can securitize that risk, then they are willing to do behavior. So one of the reasons I got in interested in the private sector is that if you can build a contract farming model, for example, where there, ag where there is aggregation of that risk with a contract farming operation and an extension program coming from the contract farming operation that then delivers these things, that makes you a somewhat scalable model. So practically, that's one thing we have seen in the field. The second thing we have seen is farmers seem to love technology. So if you give them crappy technology, we get we got high adoption rates until the things started failing, then they dropped out. The minute we gave them the electronically based stuff, which these people, the basic thing in Punjab in India is you have 90% or higher uh, cell phones and 60 or 70% smartphones out of these people. So they, they will give them good technology they want. I, I really like uh, your lecture. Uh, to say, generally uh, speaking, uh, this one thing that I knew about water, that we don't really have water scarcity problem, but uh, water management problem, and I think that is really consistent with, uh, with, with your thing. Uh, one thing that people don't realize is what is the role of the private sector in it? In India, many years ago, I started working in drip irrigation in the United States. When I stopped working on it, there was 4% adoption. Last year I looked at it, we have 45% adoption in California. I know that now people start using drip, cell phone precision technology. What is the role of the private sector in uh, developing, uh, in introducing these technologies? At I know now that in India several companies are doing it. I know that in India, uh, in Africa, several companies have started to introduce this technology. Generally, they take 30 to 40 years. That will be the time of uh, greenhouse gases. Secondly, in India and in many other countries, there is a lot of people are tired of uh, farming. They go to school. How does that affect? You have less farmers, but they are more professional. How does that affect the irrigation? Those are excellent questions. I mean, this, these are, again, experiential answers. They are not based on theory. Um, what I find is that farmers want to have someone who's going to hold their hand to a certain extent. So if you have an aggregator who does all the technologies and gives them guidance, seed provision, procurement, uh, this is a model that is mutually beneficial to these people. Now on the contract farming side, there are dangers because there's, there's exploitation potential also. But the interesting thing here is that there are corporations who seem to be a bit more educated about this issue, because what they are seeing is that if you can get the practices that you want in, you can reduce your transaction costs, because you can go from yields of one to five, hectare, five tons per hectare, and this is mutually beneficial. Now, where the gap is, is their willingness to share the increased wealth with the farmer. And that is where our input cooperatives working with farmers are leveraging this. The marketing cooperatives have not worked. So I think that's, that's one direction that I think is beneficial. But the risk side, as I mentioned earlier, the aggregator has to pick that up because you cannot suddenly dump that back on these guys. come from the same university, we should talk more often, but uh, my question is, um, we understand that about two-thirds of the water used by agriculture uh, 
is subsoil moisture, or the so-called green water. Um, and you've been talking mostly about irrigation. Now, what's your take on the other, yeah, on the other so parts? This is why you know I was hitting the <laughs> volatility issue because, um, okay, so let me put it this way: if you have a year in which the gaps in the rainy season are short, the yields from rain-fed agriculture can be spectacular. Now, consider years in which those gaps are big. So in the monsoonal climate, in the tropics, this is where the issue is. So I think it's not rainfed versus irrigated agriculture. It's the issue of how you manage those gaps. And going across years, the further issue is how do you manage uh, the food storage as well. So you need a system where you have a good food storage system, not just a water storage system. And that way you can optimize uh, where the investment should be. Thank you, Okamano. I think we'll uh, continue this discussion later at lunch and uh, go on to the next week. Illinois.